The Bloodstained Pavement by Agatha Christie. It's curious, said Joyce Lamprey, but I hardly like telling you my story. It happened a long time ago, five years to be exact, but it sort of haunted me ever since. The smiling, bright top part of it, and the hidden gruesomeness underneath. And the queer thing is that the sketch I painted at the time has become tinged with the same atmosphere. When you first look at it, it is just a rough sketch of a little steep Cornish street with the sunlight on it. But if you look long enough at it, something sinister creeps in. I have never sold it, but I never look at it. It lives in the studio in the corner with its face to the wall. The name of the place was Rathole. It is a queer little Cornish fishing village, very picturesque, too picturesque perhaps. There is rather too much of the atmosphere of year old Cornish tea house about it. It has shops with bobbed headed girls in smoking doing hand illuminated motors on parchment. It is pretty and it is quaint, but it is very self consciously so. Don't I know? said Raymond West, groaning. The curse of the Sharbank, I suppose. No matter how narrow the lanes leading down to them, no picturesque village is safe. Joyce nodded. There are narrow lanes that lead down to Rathole and very steep, like the side of a house. Well, to get on with my story. I had come down to Cornwall for a fortnight, to sketch. There is an old inn in Rathole. The Paul Howith Arms. It was supposed to be the only house left standing by the Spaniards when they shelled the place in fifteen hundred and something. Not shelled, said Raymond West, frowning. Do try to be historically accurate, Joyce. Well, at all events, they landed guns somewhere along the coast and they fired them and the houses fell down. Anyway, that is not the point. The inn was a wonderful old place with a kind of porch in front built on four pillars. I got a very good pitch and was just settling down to work when a car came creeping and twisting down the hill. Of course, it would stop before the inn, just where it was most awkward for me. The people got out, a man and a woman. I didn't notice them particularly. She had a kind of mauve linen dress on and a mauve hat. Presently the man came out again, and to my great thankfulness drove the car down to the quay and left it there. He strolled back past me towards the inn. Just at that moment another beastly car came twisting down, and a woman got out of it dressed in the brightest chintz frock I had ever seen, scarlet poncetiers, I think they were, and she had on one of those big native straw hats. Cuban, aren't they? in very bright scarlet. This woman did not stop in front of the inn, but drove the car farther down the street towards the other one. Then she got out, and the man seeing her gave an astonished shout. Carol! he cried. In the name of all that is wonderful! Fancy meeting you in this out-of-the-way spot! I haven't seen you for years! Hello! There's Marjorie, my wife, you know. You must come and meet her. They went up the street towards the inn side by side, and I saw the other woman had just come out of the door and was moving down towards them. I had just a glimpse of the woman called Carol as she passed me by, just enough to see a very white powdered chin and a flaming scarlet mouth, and I wondered, I just wondered, if Marjorie would be so very pleased to meet her. I hadn't seen Marjorie near too, but in the distance she looked dowdy and extra prim and proper. Well, of course, it was not any of my business, but you get very queer little glimpses of life sometimes, and you can't help speculating about them. From where they were standing, I could just catch fragments of their conversation that floated down to me. They were talking about bathing. The husband, whose name seemed to be Dennis, 
wanted to take a boat and row round the coast. There was a famous cave well worth seeing, so he said, about a mile along. Carol wanted to see the cave too, but suggested walking along the cliffs and seeing it from the land side. She said she hated boats. In the end, they fixed it that way. Carol was to go along the cliff path and meet them at the cave, and Dennis and Marjorie would take a boat and row round. Hearing them talk about bathing made me want to bathe too. It was a very hot morning, and I wasn't doing particularly good work. Also, I fancied that the afternoon sunlight would be far more attractive in effect. So I packed up my things and went off to a little beach that I knew of. It was quite the opposite direction from the cave, and was rather a discovery of mine. I had a ripping bath there, and I lunched off a tin tongue and two tomatoes, and I came back in the afternoon full of confidence and enthusiasm to get on with my sketch. The whole of Rat Hole seemed to be asleep. I had been right about the afternoon sunlight. The shadows were far more telling. The Paul Harwith arms was the principal note of my sketch. A ray of sunlight came slanting obliquely down and hit the ground in front of it and had rather a curious effect. I gathered that the bathing party had returned safely because two bathing dresses, a scarlet one and a dark blue one, were hanging from the balcony, drying in the sun. Something had gone a bit wrong with one corner of my sketch and I bent over it for some moments during something to put it right. When I looked up again, there was a figure leaning against one of the pillars of the polha with arms, who seemed to have appeared there by magic. He was dressed in seafaring clothes and was, I suppose, a fisherman. But he had a long, dark beard. And if I had been looking for a model for a wicked Spanish captain, I couldn't have imagined anyone better. I got to work with feverish haste before he should move away though from his attitude he looked as though he was perfectly prepared to prop up the pillars through all eternity. He did move, however, but luckily not until I had got what I wanted. He came over to me and he began to talk. Oh, how that man talked! Rato, he said, was a very interesting place. I knew that already, but although I said so, that didn't save me. I had the whole history of the shelling, I mean the destroying, of the village, and how the landlord of the Polha with arms was the last man to be killed. Run through on his own threshold by a Spanish captain's sword, and of how his blood spurted out on the pavement, and no one could wash out the stain for a hundred years. It all fitted in very well with the languorous, drowsy feeling of the afternoon. The man's voice was very suave, and yet, at the same time, there was an undercurrent in it of something rather frightening. He was very obsequious in his manner, yet I felt underneath that he was cruel. He made me understand the Inquisition and the terrors of all the things the Spaniards did better than I had ever done before. All the time he was talking to me, I went on painting, and suddenly I realized that in the excitement of listening to his story, I had painted in something that was not there. On that white square of pavement, where the sun fell before the door of the polha with arms, I had painted in bloodstains. It seemed extraordinary that the mind could play such tricks with the hand. But as I looked over towards the inn again, I got a second shock. My hand had only painted what my eyes saw drops of blood on the white pavement. I stared for a minute or two. Then I shut my eyes, said to myself, Don't be stupid, there's nothing there really. Then I opened them again, but the bloodstains were still there. I suddenly felt I couldn't stand it. I interrupted the fisherman's flood of language. Tell me, I said, my eyesight is not very good. Are those bloodstains on that pavement over there? He looked at me indulgently and kindly. 
No blood stains in these days, lady. What I am telling you about is nearly five hundred years ago. Yes, I said. But now, on the pavement, the words died away in my throat. I knew, I knew that he wouldn't see what I was seeing. I got up and, with shaking hands, began to put my things together. As I did so, the young man who had come in the car that morning came out of the inn door. He looked up and down the street perplexedly. On the balcony above, his wife came out and collected the bathing things. He walked down towards the car, but suddenly swerved and came across the road towards the fisherman. "Tell me, my man," he said, "you don't know whether the lady who came in that second car there has got back yet." Lady in a dress with flowers all over it? No, sir, I haven't seen her. She went along the cliff towards the cave this morning. I know, I know. We all bathed there together, and then she left us to walk home, and I have not seen her since. It can't have taken her all this time. The cliffs round here are not dangerous, are they? It depends, sir, on the way you go. The best way is to take a man who knows the place with you. He very clearly meant himself and was beginning to en enlarge on the theme, but the young man cut him short unceremoniously and ran back towards the inn, calling up to his wife on the balcony. "I say, Marjorie, Carol hasn't come back yet. Odd, isn't it?" I didn't hear Marjorie's reply, but her husband went on. Well, we can't wait any longer. We've got to push on to Penrithia. Are you ready? I will turn the car. He did as he had said, and presently the two of them drove off together. Meanwhile, I had deliberately been nerving myself to prove how ridiculous my fancies were. When the car had gone, I went over to the inn and examined the pavement closely. Of course, there were no blood stains there. No, all along it had been the result of my distorted imagination. Yet, somehow, it seemed to make the thing more frightening. It was while I was standing there that I heard the fisherman's voice. He was looking at me curiously. You thought you saw blood stains here, eh, lady? I nodded. That is very curious. That is very curious. We have got a superstition here, lady. If anyone sees those blood stains, he paused. Well, I said. He went on in a soft voice, Cornish in intonation, but unconsciously smooth and well-bred in its pronunciation, and completely free from Cornish turns of speech. They do say, lady. That if any one sees those blood stains, that there will be a death within twenty-four hours. Creepy. It gave me a nasty feeling all down my spine. He went on persuasively. There is a very interesting tablet in the church, lady, about a death. No thanks, I said decisively, and I turned sharply on my heel and walked up the street towards the cottage where I was lodging. Just as I got there, I saw in the distance the woman called Carol coming along the cliff path. She was hurrying. Against the grey of the rocks, she looked like some poisonous scarlet flower. Her hat was the colour of blood. I shook myself. Really, I had blood on the brain. Later, I heard the sound of a car. I wondered whether she too was going to Penrith. But she took the road to left in the opposite direction. I watched the car crawl up the hill and disappear, and I breathed somehow more easily. Rathall seemed its quiet, sleepy self once more. If that is all," said Raymond West as Joyce came to a stop, "I will give you my verdict at once. Indigestion, spots before the eyes after meals." It isn't all," said Joyce. "You have got to hear the sequel." 
I read it in the paper two days later under the heading of Sea Bathing Fatality. It told how Mrs. Dacre, the wife of Captain Dennis Dacre, was unfortunately drowned at Landia Cove, just a little farther along the coast. She and her husband were staying at the time at the hotel there and had declared their intention of bathing, but a cold wind sprang up. Captain Dacre had declared it was too cold, so he and some other people in the hotel had gone off to the golf links nearby. Mrs. Dacre, however, had said it was not too cold for her and she went off alone down to the cove. As she didn't return, her husband became alarmed, and in company with his friends went down to the beach. They found her clothes lying beside a rock, but no trace of the unfortunate lady. Her body was not found until nearly a week later when it was washed ashore at a point some distance down the coast. There was a bad blow on her head which had occurred before death, and the theory was that she must have dived into the sea and hit her head on a rock. As far as I could make out, her death would have occurred just twenty-four hours after the time I saw the bloodstains. I protest, said Sir Henry. This is not a problem. This is a ghost story. Miss Lemprea is evidently a medium. Mr. Petrick gave his usual cuff. One point strikes me, he said, that blow on the head. We must not, I think, exclude the possibility of foul play. But I do not see that we have any data to go upon. Miss Lemprey's hallucination or vision is interesting, certainly, but I do not see clearly the point on which she wishes us to pronounce. Indigestion and coincidence, said Raymond. And anyway, you can't be sure that they were the same people. Besides, the curse, or whatever it was, would only apply to the actual inhabitants of Rattle. I feel said Sir Henry, that the sinister seafaring man has something to do with his tale. But I agree with Mr. Petherick. Miss Lemprea has given us very little data. Joyce turned to Dr. Pender, who smilingly shook his head. It is a most interesting story, he said. But I am afraid I agree with Sir Henry and Mr. Petherick that there is very little data to go upon. Joyce then looked curiously at Miss Marple, who smiled back at her. I too think you are just a little unfair, Joyce dear, she said. Of course, it is different for me. I mean, we, being women, appreciate the point about clothes. I don't think it is a fair problem to put to a man. It must have meant a lot of rapid changing. What a wicked woman! and a still more wicked man. Joy stared at her. Aunt Jane, she said. Miss Marple, I mean. I believe, I do really believe, you know the truth. Well, dear, said Miss Marple, it is much easier for me sitting here quietly than it was for you, and being an artist you are so susceptible to atmosphere aren't you? Sitting here with one's knitting, one just sees the facts. Bloodstains dropped on the pavement from the bathing dress hanging above, and being a red bathing dress, of course, the criminals themselves did not realize it was bloodstained. Poor thing, poor young thing. Excuse me, Miss Marple, said Sir Henry. But you do know that I am entirely in the dark still. You and Miss Lemprey seem to know what you are talking about, but we men are still in utter darkness. I will tell you the end of the story now, said Joyce. It was a year later. I was at a little east coast seaside resort, and I was sketching, when suddenly I had that queer feeling one has of something having happened before. There were two people, a man and a woman, on the pavement in front of me, and they were greeting a third person, a woman dressed in a scarlet ponsettia chintz dress. 
Carol, by all that is wonderful, fancy meeting you after all these years. You don't know my wife. Chuan, this is an old friend of mine, Miss Harding. I recognized the man at once. It was the same Dennis I had seen at Rattle. The wife was different. That is, she was a Joan instead of a Marjorie. But she was the same type, young and rather dowdy and very inconspicuous. I thought for a minute and I was going mad. They began to talk of going bathing. I will tell you what I did. I marched straight then and there to the police station. I thought they would probably think I was off my head, but I didn't care. And as it happened, everything was quite all right. There was a man from Scotland Yard there, and he had come down just about this very thing. It seems, oh, it's horrible to talk about, that the police had got suspicions of Dennis Dacry. That wasn't his real name. He took different names on different occasions. He got to know girls, usually quite inconspicuous girls without many relatives or friends. He married them and insured their lives for large sums. And then... Oh, it's horrible. The woman called Carol was his real wife, and they always carried out the same plan. That is really how they came to catch him. The insurance companies became suspicious. He would come to some quiet seaside place with his new wife, then the other woman would turn up, and they would all go bathing together. Then the wife would be murdered, and Carol would put on her clothes and go back in the boat with him. Then they would leave the place, wherever it was, after inquiring for the supposed Carol, and when they got outside the village, Carol would hastily change back into her own flamboyant clothes and a vivid makeup and would go back there and drive off in her own car. They would find out which way the current was flowing, and the supposed death would take place at the next bathing place along the coast that way. Carol would play the part of the wife and would go down to the some lonely beach and would leave the wife's clothes there by a rock and depart in a flowery chintz dress to wait quietly until her husband could rejoin her. I suppose when they killed poor Marjorie, some of the blood must have spurted over Carol's bathing suit, and being a red one, they didn't notice it, as Miss Marple says. But when they hung it over the balcony, it tripped. Ugh! She gave a shiver. I can see it still. Of course, said Sir Henry. I remember very well now. Davis was the man's real name. It had quite slipped my memory that one of his many Elisas was Dacry. They were an extraordinarily cunning pair. It always seemed so amazing to me that no one spotted the change of identity. I suppose, as Miss Marple says, clothes are more easily identified than faces. But it was a very clever scheme. For although we suspected Davis, it was not easy to bring the crime home to him, as he always seemed to have an, an, um, an impeachable alibi. Aunt Jane, said Raymond, looking at her curiously, how do you do it? You have lived such a peaceful life, and yet nothing seems to surprise you. I always find one thing very like another in this world, said Miss Marple. There was Mrs. Green, you know. She buried five children, and every one of them insured. Well, naturally, one began to get suspicious. She shook her head. There is a great deal of wickedness in village life. I hope you dear young people will never realize how very wicked the world is. The End